So uh, the first architecture uh, we would like to introduce it's a, and the general idea is actually also very, very popular in modern, uh, the lots of application and in modern deep learning is called the O2 encoder. And the general idea and the architecture itself is also become very, very popular in the state of art, uh, different uh, deep learning architectures. But overall, the O2 encoder, actually the structure, the network structure is somewhat different from the its native structure totally a bit different from the convolutional neural networks or much layer perception that you have already learned in previous lectures. The O2 encoder is itself, uh, is itself an unsupervised learning architecture, which meant before you have already learned the convolutional neural networks, you have also learned the much layer perception and which meant uh, in all the cases, you needed to know the label of the image or label of your samples, but here, the O2 encoder is designed, um, most of the O2 encoder is designed for the unsupervised learning purpose, uh, purposes, which means that uh, to learn the O2 encoder, you do not have any label information about each of the samples. So then how to, so the, uh, then how to uh, form a valid architecture that we, in O2 encoder, there are two, usually there are two networks. The first one we call the encoder. And uh, the second one we call the decoder. So you can understand the encoder is a way such that we can uh, use our input data to learn some hidden factors, which means that, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, all the we assume that all the images are controlled are generated by some latent factors. The Z maybe the maybe the first dimension of the Z determines the pose or the gender of the person. The second dimension of the Z determines if the person wear glass or not. And the third dimension of the Z determines if, uh, the pose of the face. So the Z are some latent factors that we want to learn from, from our data. So the, the role of the encoder is to project our observation, the data in observation space, which is usually in a high dimensional into a low dimensional space. So this is the role of the encoder and it's uh, implemented by a neural network with a parameter of the phi. So Z equals G phi of the X. And on the same time, we also, the O2 encoder also have another uh, capture, the decoder. And the role of the decoder uh, in the O2 encoder structure is to try to do some kinds of the reconstruction. So which means we expect that uh, just using the code we learned in the bottleneck layer, we can uh, precisely or without any distortion to reconstruct our data X. For example, uh, this is the images of the cell, and then maybe the cell is in a very high dimensional space in a dimension of D, big D, and then we project the cell's image in a, maybe just a one or two or four dimensional space, and we expect that just to use the low dimensional representation with four dimensional, we can precisely reconstruct the cell images and uh, definitely in the uh, reconstruction phase, there are some information laws and uh, so, but uh, overall we expect the reconstruction error can be as small as possible. So this is the one way uh, how to use uh, unsupervised, unsupervised, uh, unsupervisedly design of neural networks without any supervisions. So the general idea behind it that we need to have the encoder, we also need to have a decoder and the, and the is that we project our observations in high dimensional into a low dimensional space and expect that use a low dimensional code we can reconstruct on the data. And the thing that if uh, instead of, uh, for example, use the um, uh, very complicated uh, neural networks or much layer perception or convolutional neural networks in the both encoder and the decoder, suppose that uh, there is just a linear mapping, which means that uh, we uh, assume that the Z equals to the W transpose of the X. W transpose is a linear mapping support. And then we're trying to reconstruct our data by the X hat equals to the W Z. And uh, so in this case, the O2 encode, and then we're trying to minimize the reconstruction error. 
and then it can be proved that the solution by minimize the reconstruction error and use a linear encode and decode, the solution is exactly the same to the principle of component analysis. So which means that um, the PCA, which is more maybe in, I assume that uh, lots of you have already learned the basic machine learning course, the PCA is the maybe the most popular way to do the dimensionality reduction. So PCA can be understood as a very, very special case of the O2 encoder if we use a linear mapping. But the thing that we know that is just the powerfulness of neural network is that it introduced some long linear mapping, so which gives us a very, very powerful way to learn better code than the principal component analysis. Now, suppose um, uh, we have already, uh, we use uh, uh, a minister data site, uh, which is a digital data site, which consists of 10 different images. And then we train our first autoencoder, the naive autoencoder, and then we visualize our latent code. So, on um, which mm -hmm. the image uh, is on the right. And here, uh, different points correspond to the latent code of one of the images, and then. Uh, and the, uh, the different color corresponds to the latent representation with respect to different classes. We have 10 classes, digital zero to the digital nine. So there will be 10 different colors. And then for all the training samples, we project uh, uh, all the training samples, all the images in a high dimensional space into or in two dimensional space. So we can visualize their latent representations. So uh, at first uh, we may feel that indeed, uh, uh, the autoencoder indeed can learn some useful patterns because we can obvious, obviously see that some digits, for example, the digit one, uh, the it project uh, in this region, which is maybe a different from uh, from the region of some other digits. Maybe so, for example, this is uh, roughly the region of the digital zero, and whereas this is roughly the um, the region of the digital two. So which means that if the, uh, the autoencoder can still learn some useful patterns, if the digits uh, belong to different uh, classes or, or the image de 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 belong to different classes or belong to different um, categories or digits, it will, the projected region will be some, they do not, will be somewhat different. So which means that the autoencoder can somewhat learn in a latent space that is help us to separate different uh, digits or different categories. So which means the latent codes somewhat may be useful uh, from human, especially if we want to do some clustering or some other downstream uh, tasks. But the thing that um, uh, the solution, uh, we can see that the code, the latent representation are not so perfect or precise. Because on the one hand, we know that uh, we can observe that it's um, there are some gaps uh, in the latent space, for example, some region like this or some region like this. So we do not know it's hard to infer the physical meaning uh, of the gaps in this latent space. And on the other hand, there is also a problem uh, related to the separability, especially, for example, the region uh, in this area, so many uh, images are project uh, belong to different digits category project roughly into the same space. So which means even though it can give us some kinds of separability, but it's not sufficient or perfect. And moreover, uh, it's also a bit hard to interpret the the latent space. The interpret means that um, currently the I only learn the latent cost of two dimension, the Z1 and the Z2. But the thing is that we do not know the physical meaning uh, because uh, in the example uh, uh, I mentioned here, we expect maybe our first code, the Z1, can learn something useful information about our gender, whereas the second uh, dimension can learn some useful information about if the, uh, the, the pose or the rotation of the image. But here is that we just uh, uh, naively project the data, but it's hard to judge the physical meaning of Z1 or Z2, if the Z1 indeed 
uh, encode something about the rotation angle, or if the Z1 indeed encode something about the uh, uh, the gender or something, this information are totally unknown to us. So, so they are also, and the, the most important thing is that, is that the the naive autoencoder, which means that if we just naively project our data, high dimensional use the PCA or long in a PCA, project our data into a low dimensional space and trying to reconstruct, it cannot be called as a generative models because it only do the reconstruction. Reconstruction means that if I give you the uh, input sample, in essentially you can perfectly or precisely reconstruct the data, mm -hmm. but uh, it cannot guarantee you can generate the new data. For example, if your training sample are maybe the faces of different, um, the faces from 100 different person, and the, auto, the naive autoencoder can only guarantee you can, um, without any loss, without any error to reconstruct these 100 images. But it's impossible to ask the naive autoencoder to generate new images, for example, the new faces, something like that, or new music, or new signals. So this is the, the naive autoencoder cannot do. So but the general idea motivated the loss of the modern uh, the top uh, the modern AI architectures, but um, the na the naive autoencoder still have the limitations. So given this, uh, so it means that the naive autoencoder or naive PCA principle component analysis cannot be cited as a generative model. So in order to recently to model what we just mentioned to learn the latent codes and then to guarantee that we can generate the new images or new signals, as I just mentioned, we need to have in a probability perspective, in a probability sense to model at least two distributions. The first one is a margin distribution of the PZ. The second one is a distribution of the PX given Z. The reason uh, is that suppose I already learned these two distributions, then it it, it already constitutes a generative model because if we already learn the margin distribution of the PZ, then suppose the PZ look like this. And we also learn the second distribution of the PX given Z, then why we can generate uh, lots of the new images, the new data is just because we, we, we can Randomly sample a new sum, uh, randomly sample a new sample from the margin distribution PZ. For example, we can sample a point from this point, uh, a sample of uh, a Z from the uh, this point, and then put this Z into uh, th this model. We can generate a new image, and um, X one, and maybe we can also sample another data. Uh, from this point, the, we call it the Z2, we can generate a new image, the X2. And the, so the, the general idea is, suppose we know the shape of the PZ, we can randomly or arbitrarily pick one of the samples from this the PZ. And then suppose I also know the probability of PX given Z and by, by just map the Z into the observation space. So it, it, it explains why we can generate arbitrary number of new new data or new x as we wish and usually the z is in a low dimensional space as so for example in uh in this example i suppose that uh, just for the illustration purpose i assume that the latent codes are all in a two-dimensional space and uh, and uh, it's something like the plane and then we also assume that the X, the real X is in a 3D dimensional space. So it means that if we know the PZ, we can randomly sample a sample from PZ and then by use the PX given Z, we can generate a new image. And then we can also sample from another point, the blue point in the PZ and by the mapping of the PXZ, we can generate another image. And uh, also if we can have a new point, the red, new red point, again, we can generate a new image. So which means that if we can have a way to model both of these two distributions, in principle, we can generate as much as possible the new data as we wish. So uh, we know that, uh, I guess also in the previous lectures, you have learned that uh, 
the one of the most very popular loss functions or uh, uh, general idea to learn a neural network a machine learning model is that we want to maximize the log likelihood. So we apply the same idea again. Uh, the x is our input. The theta is our uh, parameters of neural networks. We so the general idea is that we expect that um, the uh, the px that we generated is uh, is at, uh, as realistic as possible to our real data. So in this sense, we expect the log of px is um, as as high as possible. So this can be understood as the, the our loss function. And then we know that by um, we know that the also by the Bayes rule we know that the px e actually equal to the um, integral of the px given z and the uh, pz and where the we need to the int integral by the z so this is by the Bayes rule so which meant uh, if we can model both these two and also have a good way to do the integration then in principle we can train a very, very good generative models. So this also explains almost all the existing modern generative models where have different ways to uh, uh, parameterize to train them, get these two distributions. So the problem now remaining is how can we model or train uh, the, those distributions and also to model the integral and um, sufficiently from our data. So for simplicity, uh, let us assume that the PZ only follow a Gaussian distribution, a standard Gaussian distribution with uh, zero of mean and um, uh, standard um, uh, uh, division of covariance matrix. And also for simplicity, we assume that uh, it's a linear mapping. So which means that, um, Uh, the we assume that the z is in a m dimensional space, and the x is in a big D dimensional space, and the and the task we want to model is that we want to model both the p z margin distribution of the p z and the conditional of the distribution of p x given z. In this way, we can know, given these two distribution, we know how to model the p x. This is our target, and but in order to implement this target, we need to have a way to understand both the PZ and the PXZ. So now, for simplicity, we assume that the PZ only just to follow a uh, uh, the PZ is kind of a Gaussian distribution, standard Gaussian distribution, and also for simplicity, we assume that the PX given Z can be parameterized by a linear transformation. And to just project the Z in an M dimensional space to project in a big D dimensional space. Uh, definitely there are some uh, uh, bias and bias term and some there maybe also suffer from some noise. And we also for simplicity assume that the noise also from a, a Gaussian distribution with a standard deviation of the uh, uh, sigma. But the, these, those are our assumptions. So now we see that under these assumptions, the PZ becomes very, very easy to model. Uh, for example, uh, if we assume that it, it's just a linear transform and uh, by some uh, very uh, straightforward um, derivation, then immediately we know that the conditional distribution uh, of the px given z also follow a Gaussian because the linear transformation of Gaussian is still a Gaussian. And so we can, uh, so the, the illustrative figure is that, so the pz uh, follow a standard uh, uh, Gaussian distribution. And uh, so now I sample a random point, the z hat from the standard Gaussian distribution. And by using the linear mapping, we can directly map the z hat into the space of the x, and the and the p x given z currently follow a new Gaussian distribution which is centered at the w z plus mu centered here, but it has still a variance which is controlled by the parameter of theorem. So, which means that for each single point in our latent space, we can project 
uh, into an input space the, the, the x, but it still which follow the Gaussian distribution in the uh, input space. Yes. Uh, yes, it can be understood. Uh, uh, this is decoder. You can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? yeah parameter. Uh, the you can understand the p x given z as the role of the decoder to trying to uh, generate uh, uh, the new image or generate uh, or reconstruct of x from the latent space. So the p x given z plays the role of the decoder. And then so we just mentioned the uh, uh, yeah yeah exactly exactly so now the question is that uh, because it's just because we assume that it's a linear mapping p y given z here and the p z also follow a Gaussian distribution. Now we know that um, the some the transformation of Gaussian is still a Gaussian. So which means that the final we can expect that the Px is still a Gaussian finally. So both these two are Gaussian, and by just uh, use um, uh, some straightforward uh, is uh, maybe not so straightforward, but uh, there are some uh, mathematical derivation to show the integral of the two Gaussian actually finally is still a Gaussian. And uh, just to use some, uh, which is from the textbook material from the bishop's paper, and we we can kindly uh, understand that the P Z as we expected still follow a Gaussian distribution, or P X sorry, finally still follow a Gaussian Gaussian distribution, but uh, the Gaussian maybe is a bit more complicated mm -hmm. than we expected it to follow. It's well the mean uh. uh is a uh, is a mu, but the variance is with the w w transpose uh, plus sigma square of the i. But the thing that uh, why we can get such an elegant solution is just we assume that there is a linear mapping, and uh, so which means that uh, uh, everything uh, the and uh, the thing that which means that the integral. Uh, over the two Gaussian can still be expressed as a Gaussian, and it's just because we significantly simplify the decoder. We assume that it's a linear decoder here, but uh, so the final is, is that the px look like this, mm, and we can, in principle, also trying to because we know both the px, we also know the px given z, we also know the pz. So in principle, we can also try to infer the posterior distribution of the PZ given X. So you can imagine the PZ given X as a way of the encoder is trying to, so let me. So what we just mentioned is that we assume that the PZ follow a Gaussian and then the PX given Z plays the role of the decoder trying to reconstruct or generate some new data from, from the latent space, and we just by the linear mapping assume that this is the uh, uh, Gaussian dispute, uh, this is Gaussian dispute, disputed. And then if we know the joint distribution of the PZX, uh, uh, we can also uh, inverse and also to inform the posterior distribution of the PZ given X. So the law of the PZ given X can be understood to use the given the input to, le to learn their latent codes. So which means that if we make the Gaussian assumptions plus the linear transformation, both the distributions can kind of be modeled after Gaussian, although the their mean and the variance may be, or covariance metrics may be somewhat different. And uh, so, uh, so suppose the PZ is standard Gaussian and the linear mapping, all the things can be modeled as a Gaussian. So the, in order to maximize the log likelihood of the PX, we can, the only uh, unknown parameters here is the transformation, uh, the W matrix, as well as the, the mu and the sigma. So this, those are the unknown parameters, but we can try to use the maximum log likelihood and assume that we have N training samples and the data is 
I, I uh, independently distributed. And in this way, we take the gradient of the uh, log of the px. We can and set the gradient equal to the zero with respect to the both of the w, the mu, and the sigma. We can finally get an uh, our analytic, analytical solution how to derive the obtain the unknown parameter of w as well as the mu as well as the sigma here. But the thing that um, uh, the thing that actually in this we significantly simplify the model. Uh, we assume that we suggest a linear model to project uh, the z into the observation space. But the thing that we know that in practice, lots of data uh, do not uh, follow a Gaussian distribution or is a single Gaussian distribution. And a linear model, the model capacity is very, very limited. So uh, uh, then we first have a break and later we will show how to make the model more complicated beyond just a linear model.